Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you that we can gather before you here in your house. We do pray that your spirit would bless us, strengthen us for worship. We pray that the glory of Christ, our mediator, would be revealed to us in many ways. We ask, Lord, that your blessing would be on our fellowship. Help us to grow in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing and we'll sing our opening hymn. You might recognize it. We sang it last week, so we should be pretty good at it this week. I, in making my plan for the worship service, I plan to have another hymn. And, and then as I was going through hymns, I came across this one. I thought, boy, this is good. We'll have this again. They realized we sang it last Sunday, so. Try one more time.
Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, who does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, lift it up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty and God. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. He has uh, chosen a people for himself, and he has uh, 
engaged in a covenant with his son to engage on behalf of these people as their surety. He would be their representative and he comes into this world to save that elect people. And he does so in the way that the Father provides by taking on our sins as our sin bearer and paying the full penalty for sin at the cross. And so the Father plans our redemption, the Son accomplishes our redemption, and then the Spirit applies that redemption to the hearts of God's people. This reminds us that salvation is of the Lord. It is all of grace. It is his monergistic work whereby he acts sovereignly, freely, and effectually to save his people. Uh, this sets us apart from those in our, our broader community who would say that uh, God makes the offer of the gospel and he does not interfere with us in any way. We are neutral observers of the gospel message and we have the basic ability to either choose for God and commit ourselves to Christ or to reject God and his message. And so man becomes something of an independent player, free to choose what he wants to do. And God's choice is only based on uh, our choice of him, which he foresees in advance. And so God does nothing to effect that choice in our hearts, to create uh, that choice in our hearts, Rather, God is, if you will, a gentleman who stands aside and waits for some, hopefully many, but possibly none, to respond to his offer of grace. The scriptures give us a different view of the work of salvation. God is not just simply uh, pleading for our salvation, uh, reasoning with us, trying to persuade us to follow after him, and then leaving it up to us, if he did that, we would surely perish. Because the heart of a man is desperately sold to sin. Paul says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And if I were to stretch out a dead body in front of you this morning and say to that body, stand up and talk, what would that dead body do? Suppose I reason with it. Look, it's not that difficult to do. You just crunch your muscles and you get up. And you talk and just blow out some breath. I can reason with that dead body, but there's no response because it is dead. And that's the biblical description of the human heart in terms of its relationship to God. It is non-responsive, unable, incapable of responding to God because... It is dead in trespasses and sins. And so what must be done to this dead body? Well, a new principle of life must be given to it. It must be made alive by somebody doing something for that dead body, which the dead body could not do for itself. There's no spontaneous regeneration here. The Spirit of God must come to that dead body and breathe life into that body causing that person to be born again, raising them from the dead, empowering them to receive the gospel message and to embrace Christ with a living faith. And so our catechism uh, speaks of the effectual application of Christ's redemption to us by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes and irresistibly draws us by His grace to Christ. He causes us to be born again. He reveals the Son to us. He opens our eyes to see. He empowers us by the resurrection power of Christ to live a new life. All of this is the effective, powerful work of the Spirit in the hearts of the elect. And so the sovereignty of God's grace is evident in that the Spirit does not rescue everyone. He rescues some. He rescues only those for whom Christ died. He rescues only those whom the Father entrusts to the Son's care. And so it is the elect, the same group of people that the Father chose, for whom the Son died, that the Spirit then goes throughout history and time and applies that work of Christ to their hearts, such that they are saved. And in this way, 
All whom the Father gave to the Son will indeed be saved and none lost. The Spirit breathes life into us. The Spirit preserves us in the course of life. The Spirit keeps us until that great day of salvation. And so the gift of the Spirit, as Paul speaks of in Galatians chapter 3, where he speaks of the, to Galatian people who were interested in perhaps going back to a works righteousness religion, and Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit by performing these works of the law or by faith? And the gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift that brings us the fullness of our salvation. It's the Spirit who washes our hearts of sin. It's the Spirit who applies the righteousness of Christ to us. The Spirit who enables us to live a new life. And so we have this redemption given to us by the sovereign grace of God the application of that grace by the Holy Spirit, third member of the Trinity, who is fully God, fully personal um, member of the Trinity, uh, who faithfully executes God's will. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer and seek God's blessings on our homes, our families, and our church. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that saving work of your spirit who at some point in our lives was pleased to renew us by your grace, plant within us a new heart, and give us a new life. We thank you that your spirit uh, granted us faith to believe in the Lord Jesus and secured our relationship to him. We do pray that your spirit would continue his gracious work in our hearts and lives, sanctifying us, purifying us of all corruption and sin, and uniting us to Christ more perfectly day by day. We do pray, Lord, that your blessing will be on our congregation. We thank you for your mercies to us in the past. We thank you for the way in which you have been pleased to answer our prayers and to help us in, uh, in difficult times. We do pray for your continued work in our congregation. We will lift up Heidi before you this morning as she uh, prepares for surgery this week. We pray that this surgery would be a blessing to her and help to her. We pray that you would relieve her of her pain and suffering. We pray that there would be no complications, but that she would have a uh, safe and uh, effective healing from this. And we do look forward to uh, your uh, mercies on her and uh, restoring her to our fellowship here uh, sometime soon. We pray for your blessing on her. And as well, be with her as she tries to do what she can to teach at Plumstead Christian School. We pray that you would bless those efforts as well and bless her students as they uh, prepare for their course work. Father, we pray uh, that you would be with uh, others in our church that are uh, struggling with uh, illnesses or other issues. We pray for uh, John Baldwin's mom, Grace. We pray that you would continue to bring her healing and help thank you for Esther's care for her and pray, Lord, for your blessing and provision for them. Uh, we pray that you would be with uh, Margaret Rawlings, Lois's mom. We pray, Lord, that your hand of healing or that your hand of blessing will be on her, that you would be near to her at this time. We pray that your spirit would comfort and strengthen her and all the family. We thank you for your work of redemption and for the encouragements that we have. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to fix our minds on Jesus and his great work on our behalf. We continue to lift up Carol Minnick and pray that you would comfort her in her loss as she continues to mourn and try to uh, reorient her life to her new situation. We thank you for her and pray that your love and grace will be upon her. Watch over George and Ella McLaren as they age and as well uh, Larry Handy and Dee Thomas. We pray, Lord, that you would Watch over them and provide for their health and strength. We pray for uh, Rhoda and for uh, Kathy Martin, for Emmanuel uh, and others who are in need of your hand of healing and help. We pray that you would bless and provide for them. We thank you for your care for Chrissy and for the healing that she's experienced. We thank you for your answers to our prayers. And we do pray that you continue to watch over her and bless her recovery. Father, we thank you for uh, 
the fellowship of the saints here, and we do pray that you would enrich our fellowship and help us to grow and to reach out to others. We pray for your blessing on those efforts and that you would be glorified in them. We thank you for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and its various ministries. We pray for the OPC uh, diaconal efforts that are ongoing in um, the Gulf Coast area in Louisiana, especially. We pray, Lord, that you would protect uh, those who go to serve. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless their efforts. Watch over our congregations uh, there who have suffered loss uh, from this storm. We pray, Lord, that they would be quickly uh, be put back on their feet again. And we pray that you would provide for their health and strength. Father, we pray that you would be with uh, our missionaries in these very complicated times for ministry. We pray that you would uh, bless and provide for them, both our home and for our missionaries. We pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and grace for how they, they reach others with the gospel of Christ. We pray for our country. We pray, Lord, that the unrest in our streets would be resolved. We pray that you would bring peace uh, and, and uh, righteousness to our communities. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over our election process. We pray that you would provide us the man of your choosing. We pray that you would protect your church and in this country and bless us that we might grow and mature and bear witness to all the earth. We thank you for uh, your mercies in our uh, government thus far. We pray for your continued blessing. Father, we pray that you would uh, watch over us as we continue in worship. We pray that you provide for our earthly needs. Help us ever more to trust in you for all things. And teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn uh, is Arise, My Soul, Arise. And that's hymn number 305, if you have to have the hymn with you. Arise, my soul, arise, and let's arise and descend.
read through the end of the chapter. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tent. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this manna from heaven above. We pray that your spirit would feed us uh, on this word. Show us the glory of our Savior and his work on our behalf as we go through this wilderness together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't listen to rock and roll much at all, and I'm only dimly aware of Led Zeppelin, a British band that was popular back in the 70s and the 80s. But I remember this song I heard it played by trombones in concert uh, called Stairway to Heaven. And uh, in this song, uh, the, the uh, lyrics uh, are rather strange. We try to follow them, and uh, they're very symbolic in, in their uh, presentation. Uh, stairway to Heaven. There's a materialistic woman at the beginning of the uh, hymn or the song, which thinks that she can find her way to heaven uh, with, with gold that, and everything that glitters. And so there seems to be uh, a reflection on the materialistic world that thinks it can find anything it wants. Heaven on Earth. Uh, through materialistic beings. When some have tried to understand the meaning of this song, uh, they've come to different conclusions regarding it. Uh, some say that it's a very spiritual song, uh, leading people to a greater sense of purity. It ends up with saying that all is one and one is all. And this is a rock that does not roll. And so there is kind of a plea for unity in humanity, one spiritual experience together. One article that I read said that this was a, a song that had many Christian allusions in it, and so therefore, uh, in many respects, was a Christian song. Well, there's more to being a Christian song than having Christian allusions. 
the stairway to heaven is indeed an image that comes to us down from both the Old and New Testaments, as we'll see. And when it talks about the May Queen, uh, about midway into the song, uh, some speculate that it is a reference to the Virgin Mary, whose birth is celebrated, I believe, in May. In any case, it seems to me to be more of a, a humanistic uh, song with no real uh, word of redemption and salvation. It's more all of us uniting together to come to our own heaven, some spiritual nirvana. In any case, the song has come under considerable criticism by Christians because of what seems to be a secret message on it through uh, called back masking, where if you get into about the third or fourth uh, stanza of this song, you have lyrics which are a little bit strange, and you experience a buzz in your head row, and then talks about things like that, but if you play it backwards at this point, it very distinctly speaks about Satan and uh, serving Satan, and both the, the, the writers of the song and uh, commentators and many people uh, say, oh, there's nothing to that. There's no way that they would do such a thing. But I listened to it, and I don't know how you can escape the fact that it's there. It's very clear. It's not just one, one word there that, that they draw a lot of things. It's a whole sentence or two. So is it really something that promotes Faith in Christ, salvation, and uh, a stairway to heaven? I don't think so. I don't think so. We do have the uh, picture of the stairway to heaven here in our text in Genesis 28, which Jacob has in a dream. Uh, God reveals himself to Jacob as Jacob is on his way from his home in Beersheba back north and east towards Haran. Now that was a trip of about 550 miles. So uh, if you're traveling about 20 miles a day, that's a pretty thorough hike uh, every day. It would take you at least about a month's time, maybe a month and a half if you take a few days off and relax and so forth. So it was a fairly lengthy journey. And at some point along the way, headed north, uh, Jacob pauses for the night as the sun sets. He finds a smooth rock that he uh, situates for himself, and then he settles down for the night. What a circumstance Jacob was in. Uh, he's had to flee his family. Uh, this is not like Abraham's servant who's going off for the search for a wife with servants with him and, and camels and uh, all kinds of treasures. As far as we can see, Jacob's here basically traveling by himself. Nothing grand here. He sets up a stone for his pillow at night. In reading Calvin's comments on this, he, he reflected on, I think, uh, the experience of many in the city of Geneva of his day, which was a city of refugees. Many who had to flee persecution from France and other places around Europe from the Roman Catholic churches, and quite often they were dispossessed of their their homes and uh, separated from families and businesses and so forth, and they had to flee to Geneva, a, a neutral city where they could find a place of refuge. And Calvin looks at Jacob's sufferings and says, you see how our great ancestor Jacob had to travel uh, alone by himself, subject to the animals around him and any marauders that might be there during the night, uh, sleep on this stone for a pillow, and make his way in, in hopes of securing a wife and a family. And he counseled the refugees of his city, and we can be mindful of it as well, sometimes God is pleased to put us through very difficult times and separate us from the comforts of this life so that we might learn to trust in God and His provision for us. And even live, learn to live by the Word of God as a 
comes to us. Now, Jacob lays down and he uh, falls asleep, and in the midst of his sleep, he has a dream. Uh, when you look through the, the Old Testament, you find that often these dreams or visions occur at night. And it's your hardest boss who makes the note that uh, on one hand, uh, God reveals himself in dreams at night so that all of the activities of the day, all of the demands of the day can be put aside and we can listen closely and carefully to that which God has to say to us at night in the dream. And Boss goes on to say that quite often God reveals himself in dreams to those whose spiritual maturity or uh, whose character was not of such a standing that it merited closer communication. And so here is Jacob who uh, acted deceptively in obtaining this blessing and now is on his way, but nonetheless is acting in faith and is obeying and respecting his parents uh, here. God is pleased to reveal himself to him in this form of a dream. You might recall that uh, as God revealed himself to uh, Abraham in a dream form in Genesis 15, remember that dream of the smoking pot going through the divided animals, and God made a covenant with Abraham at that time. It was very much a dream in which he received that revelation. And now uh, Jacob receives a similar dream from the Lord. There were no dreams, if I remember correctly, for Isaac. Uh, but he was given God's promise. God appeared to him uh, at one point and uh, assured him that the promises given to Abraham would be his. But God reveals himself in dreams to these patriarchs, but going on later in history, you have an experience where uh, Moses marries a Cushite woman, and that was not going over very well within the family. Uh, Aaron and uh, Miriam, Moses' brother and sister, were upset with Moses for marrying this armed woman, this Cushite woman. I don't know what was all going into that, but they felt that God would speak through them just as well as he would speak through Moses. And so they were arrogating to themselves the standing of a prophet. And what happens is that God calls them to appear before him at the tent of meeting and God says to them, to the, the, the fathers and the prophets of long ago, I appeared in visions and in dreams, but not so my servant Moses. Him I speak to, and in the English Standard Version, the translation is mouth to mouth. It's an immediate, very plain, direct form of speech. And it's almost as though what God is saying is that when Moses speaks, I speak. I speak through Moses. There is an intimacy there. There's a closeness, a connection there that is very close. And the Lord rebukes Aaron and Miriam for uh, their arrogance in contending with Moses, his servant. Now Moses would say that there was a prophet coming in the future much like him. And we have the Lord Jesus himself, who is not really one who received revelations. He was the very word of God. And he speaks with divine authority. A clear message. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 1 that God spoke to the fathers in many times and in many ways. But in these last days he spoke to us in his son. For he has appointed the heir of all things. And so the final revelation of God is given to us in Jesus the Son. He is the one who reveals the Father to us and shows us the way of salvation. And he will indeed be the one who speaks to Jacob in the spirit. So Jacob has this dream and he sees this ladder reaching up into the heavens from the earth right where he was sleeping. And on this ladder there would be angels of God ascending and descending on this ladder. 
where another interpretation or translation would be a stairway leading up to heaven. Uh, you might think of some of the uh, ancient temples back in the day called ziggurats, where they would uh, have stairways that would lead you up to the very top of this uh, pyramid-like structure. And it would be there that sacrifices would be made in an attempt to appease the gods or whatever they believed in. And, and so there's some thought that maybe something of that was in, in mind here. But we have at least a stairway or a ladder going up into heaven. And this angelic presence going up and down the ladder. Jacob on earth, the angels going up and down. And then the translations say that the Lord was above the ladder in heaven. Now here's the picture that uh, God revealed to Jacob in a dream. Now, there is one possible alternative for uh, saying that the Lord was above the ladder. The other alternative is to say that the Lord was beside Jacob on the earth. And while all the translations uh, say that the Lord was above the ladder, uh, I do find it compelling and interesting to uh, translate it as the Lord being at the, the foot of the ladder. But we'll see more of that later on. And so Jacob has this dream and he has this dramatic image in front of him. And what does it mean? Well, Jacob is not left to speculate on the meaning of this dream and give his own interpretation. God interprets it for him. So it is we are reminded that we should not be satisfied with mere symbolism mere pictures and types, but we need God's sovereign interpretation, God's word accompanying the sign so that we can understand that which is given to us. And so when we take part in the communion table, we have the sign, the visual elements, but we also have the word that interprets the meaning of the supper. And except we listen to the word, we don't properly understand the meaning or significance of the supper. And here the Roman Catholic Church drifts off in applying a different meaning to the supper than what Scripture itself provides. We should always allow God to be His own interpreter and listen to what He has to say. In that light, listen to how God describes Himself. He says, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and of your father Isaac. It's wonderful how God represents himself to Jacob. First, we see that God is sovereign in his self-disclosure. God is free to reveal himself to us. And he does so on his own terms. He doesn't leave it up to us to try to describe God or come up with some uh, understanding of who God is. He doesn't wait for us to say, well, God is the unmoved mover. He's the first cause. He is the inevitable, the great negation, the ground of being. See, God doesn't wait for us in our philosophy and our religious speculations to come up with a view of God. He reveals himself to us. And how much more wonderful and beautiful and comforting is it to know that we have the God who describes himself as the Lord, that is the sovereign ruler of the heavens and the earth, who is also the God of Abraham and of Isaac. We don't have an abstract concept of a deity up in the heavens, but we have a living, personal God who enters into covenant with His people and identifies Himself with His people, even if some of them have already passed on as an Abraham. Quite possibly awesome, Abraham. At a later point, remember Jesus in a conversation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, rather, I think more directly, on the subject of the resurrection, brings up the fact that God identifies himself as the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And then Jesus makes this point, this deduction from God's word, that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so Jesus affirms that our spirits depart from this life and enter into the presence of God 
We are alert and awake in the presence of God, and we are worshiping the Lord as our God. God is the object of our worship in glory. And so God comes to Jacob, who's by himself, asleep at night, on a long journey, separated from his father, separated from his family. And God comes to him at this pivotal moment in his life and reveals himself and says, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and of your father Isaac. What a comfort it is for us to know that the God of our fathers is our God too. That the God of uh, perhaps generations of ancestors in the past confessed is the one that we too embrace and believe in today. Um, God uh, says to uh, Jacob that he will uh, bless him and provide for him, give him the blessings of Abraham of long ago. Uh, he will uh, give him this land in which he dwells, uh, and his descendants will reach out to north and south, east and west, and spread out across this land. God will bless him and says, and furthermore, I will be with you. And Keep you wherever you go, and I'll bring you back here. And so, as Jacob's about to leave this land, he is reminded of the fact that God has specially revealed Himself to his, his father and grandfather in this land, the land of Canaan. This is the place where God has committed Himself to His people. And Jacob needs to be anchored to this land and to the promises of God that are here. He's not to go off to Haran, find a wife there, and then start life off out there and, and finish life there apart from the kingdom of God. Uh, God reminds him that his purpose for him is that he come back and live in this land that he would provide for him. And so God assures him of his presence throughout his life, and recall how significant the presence of God was in Abraham's life, and how he was blessed because of God's presence. He assures Jacob, I will be present with you, and I will keep you, I will protect you. How much he needed to know as he traveled alone and had to live by his own wits, that God would protect him. I'm mindful of Act 3, Scene 2, Shakespeare's Hamlet where Hamlet sees his friend Horatio come and approach him, approaching him. And uh, Hamlet greets him very warmly. And Horatio is somewhat taken aback by the friendliness of Chris Hamlet's greeting because Horatio is just an um, ordinary person. And uh, Hamlet says to him, uh, something to the effect, now the words are going to escape me, of course, but something to the effect that uh, don't be afraid of me uh, speaking to you in these ways, for what have, what benefit have I of flattering you who have no revenue to uh, feed and clothe you? Uh, have I recognized that there's no benefit to flattering a man who's by himself and has no worldly significance to the benefits of other than his good spirits to uh, feed and clothe him. And Jacob was very much in a similar situation by himself. Nothing to support him. Utterly, utterly dependent upon God's provision for him. And God says to him, I will keep you. How much we need to know that in difficult times? God will keep you. He will preserve you. He will provide for you with daily bread. But most especially, He will keep you in His kingdom and preserve you for that moment. So Jacob awakes from this dream and he says, this place is an amazing thing. It's amazing. God is present here and I knew it not. Uh, he was suddenly impressed by the fact that this was the place where God reveals himself to his people and that he revealed himself to Jacob. This is perhaps the first time that God indeed revealed himself to Jacob in this way. Jacob had the promise related to him 
about how the younger would serve the, or the older would serve the younger, uh, given that his birth, and he had the blessing of Isaac that came upon him. Uh, but now God Himself speaks with Jacob and assures him of His presence and blessing. And Jacob is amazed. And says, "How awesome is this place! It is the very house of God and the gate of heaven." So uh, Jacob is in wonderment at what God has revealed to him. We spoke a moment ago about the work of the Holy Spirit and causing us to be renewed. There's that moment in our lives where God sovereignly calls us to Himself and speaks powerfully to us such that we suddenly have our eyes open to where we are standing. We're standing in God's world. We're standing in the kingdom of God. This is a place of glory. Our eyes are open to spiritual things. Because the Spirit of God has been at work within us. And His Word has drawn us to faith in Christ. How awesome is this place. It is the house of God and the gate of heaven. That's beautiful imagery that Jacob makes use of. He'll later name that place Beth, which Interestingly enough, if you come into our church building and right to see a cornerstone which says this is Bethel Mennonite Church. And as I thought about that over the years, I thought to myself, I should have named the church Bethel Presbyterian Church. I just kept that name rather than going first, but it is what it is. Bethel, the house of God. And Jacob says, this is the gate of heaven. For him, this is his entrance into the kingdom of God. God reveals himself sovereignly to Jacob. Now, note you have a particular redemption here, right? God did not reveal himself to Pharaoh, to Abimelech, in a sovereign way, in a gracious way. He did not reveal himself to Ishmael, to Esau, but to Jacob. He reveals himself personally, directly. And it assures him that he will be with him. Why? Because Jacob was so right and powerful or so good and righteous? Not at all. It was a sovereign act of God. He was pleased to save Jacob. Jacob, I love that Esau I hated. So God, by his grace, set apart Jacob for himself and revealed himself to him so that Jacob could say, This is the gate. Jesus was asked are there many that enter the kingdom of God or are there few that enter the kingdom of God Luke 13 and Jesus says that there are few that enter the gate. The gate is narrow and few will be that only and strive to enter that narrow gate. Put everything else aside. There's one thing that you must do in life. Enter into the kingdom of God. See the blessings of that kingdom and have them for yourself. So Jacob has his eyes open to the kingdom of God, the very presence of God in his life, and he uh, then responds to God's revelation to him by uh, taking that stone uh, and putting up, it up on its end, so it's sitting upright, and then he anoints the stone with oil uh, and says, this is the house of God, this is Bethel. And, and and this would be a place where God would be worshipped. Uh, the, the stone would be a memorial to the revelation of God to Jacob here at this place. And it may be that at future points, perhaps, Jacob would pass by this place and find it. And find that it was a sacred place. This is where I came to know the Lord. You have a place like that in your life. For me, it's in a bedroom at, on 17 Bergman Drive in Africa my parents' home where I came to faith in Christ. Uh, the middle bed, the single bed. Sacred. Because God revealed himself there. And the anointing of oil reminds us of the Holy Spirit coming down upon the church of God and the blessing of that brings. This is the house of God. And then Jacob says something that we might 
misunderstand as we look at it. He says that God will indeed, excuse me, if God will uh, bless me on my journey and bring me back home safely and restore me to my father's house, then he will be my God. And I will serve him and give him a tenth of all that I possess. And in the English, it sounds like what Jacob is saying is that I'm going to wait and see. And I'll see if God, in fact, is true to his word, whether he will be with me along the course of my journey, and whether he'll bring me back home to my parents' house. And if he fulfills his word in essence, then at that point in time, he has proved himself to me, and I will believe in him and give him a tithe of all that I can have. And that's, I think, not the proper way of understanding This promise of God was so rich and wonderful to Jacob, and indeed it's a promise that has to win that the coming of Christ will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth that will be fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, this uh, promise uh, is something that Jacob believed in right there. And what Jacob is saying is, if indeed it is true, as it is true, that God will bless me along this way, then I will serve him and give him a tenth of all that I have. I will honor him as my God and serve him. Jacob is committing himself right there and then to God, not waiting for some future moment. It's on the basis of God's revelation to him and the surety of his promises that are given to him that Jacob commits himself to the Lord and is ready to serve God for all that he is. This may be Jacob's own conversion experience where he enters into a personal relationship with the Lord and gives his life over to him. But this dream that Jacob had would be uh, an important place in his life Later on in the 32nd chapter, as he's about to uh, come back and uh, approach his brother Esau, and you recall, later in the chapter, Esau comes to meet him with 400 uh, soldiers on horseback, a rather intimidating approach. Uh, Jacob, at the beginning of that chapter, meets with a camp of angels. And so this vision of the angels going up to heaven and coming down is a vision that would reach its fulfillment in many ways, but here at this camp which you call Mahanaim, uh, two camps, this camp and the angelic camp, Jacob is reminded of God's promise and fulfillment of his promise that he will bless him. And if you read through the remainder of Genesis 32, um, you find that Jacob divides his family up into two camps. They approach Esau, and he, he pleads the basis of this promise that he receives here that God would be with him and would protect him and bring him back to his father's house and says, Now let this word come to pass. And indeed, uh, God would bless him and enable him to return. So Jacob saw the angels and the way that they came down. They go up into heaven with uh, Jacob's request and needs going up to the Lord. And they come down from heaven bringing assistance and help and grace to minister to him. And so as we read in the Psalms and in Hebrews chapter 1, they are ministering spirits to the saints. But most of all, we see that they go up and down on this ladder. And what is this ladder? The ladder is Christ. Jesus meets with uh, Philip and Nathaniel. Nathaniel is off, uh, and Philip runs off and meets his friend Nathaniel and calls him to meet with Jesus. And he comes, and Jesus says to him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel says, Well, how do you know me? And Jesus says, Well, I knew you when you sat under the fig tree. He says, My Lord, and my God. I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord appeared to you in the hand of under that fig tree. And now Jesus says to him, You now believe, now that I just told you that I saw you under the fig tree, you'll see greater things than this. You'll see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus is the mediator between heaven and earth. And all the blessings of heaven come down to us through Jesus Christ. 
And if you will, he is the one who's come down from heaven to the earth to stand beside the Jacobs and all those who call upon him. The fabulous blessing of salvation. And he is the one through whom all the requests come to God. Jesus is that stairway to heaven. He's the only way in which we, we may have access to that heavenly city. Jesus is the gate of heaven. And Jesus we dwell in the house of God. God all us to dwell in him. And so, uh, in your earthly pilgrimage, even if it brings you into places of hardship, know that God is promised you with you all along the way. He will bring you safely. He will not leave you until he's accomplished that which he's intended. Which means he will not leave you until he brings you to himself in glory in that future kingdom where you're dwell with him forever and ever. And you won't need a rock for the pillow again. Father in heaven, we thank you for your birth. We thank you for Jesus who uh, is the source of blessing us and the salvation itself. We pray that you help us to rest in Him and to see our hope of heaven entirely in Him. We pray for those who may be outside that kingdom who even at this moment are tending to their lawns and playing sports or uh, doodling on their computers. We pray for them to please change their hearts and minds and deliver them by this revelation of yourself from long ago. We pray in Jesus' name.
Forgive us for our unwillingness to submit to your dominion. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for these things and grant us grace, grace of salvation, grace of the forgiveness of all of our sins. We pray for those of us who are joined to Christ and yet fail to live up to that which you have revealed. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive our hearts and minds, cleanse us of every uh, sinful thought, word, and deed. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to walk more fully in the power of your Spirit and in the light of your Word. We ask for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, the ladder to heaven, in whose name we pray. Amen. We are reminded of God's forgiveness in these words from the prophet Micah. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in his steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Let's sing to the Lord our concluding hymn. The middle hymn reflected on Christ's work with our great high priest who represents us before God. Here we sing of Christ as our great king who rules us uh, to his glory and praise. We're using your hymn was number 300. And uh, hail to the Lord's name. Let's stand to sing.